the Ephesians, or the churches in Ephesus. So Ephesians chapter number five this morning. Uh, and encourage you to uh, stick around uh, this afternoon at noon. We'll, uh, we'll pick up where we left off and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look this morning at, uh, in this afternoon at chapter five, uh, verses one through 21. Uh, this morning we'll get down to verse number 14, Lord willing. And so uh, beginning at verse one, let's read. And then also note, there's a sermon notes page for you there uh, in the bulletin this morning. Have some notes and uh, helps you to follow along a little bit. Uh, and uh, there's also a little notes page for kids. I forgot to mention that earlier, but uh, for that little table in the back as you make your way in, if you'd like to grab that, you can. So Ephesians chapter number five, let's read that down to verse 14. Therefore, and we'll come to see uh, why it's there in the first place, uh, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it, the scripture says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And to all of these words, God's people say, Amen. Be what you are. That's what Paul is telling us here uh, in this passage. And we've seen this the past uh, chapter as well. Chapters 4 and 5 and also we'll come to see chapter 6. Be what you are. That's the message of Paul in this exhortation section of Ephesians chapters 4 through 6. Be what you are. Back in chapter 4 at verse number 1. Remember what he said there. He called us to walk. And we said that Paul uses this image of walk to describe what again? What is, why is he using the word walk? How to live. Good. So this is a, a metaphor for living. And so it's an Old Testament language I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is in the Old Testament. There are two ways and there are two paths. And people who are believers walk on one path and those who are not walk on another So walk or live in a manner, chapter 4, verse 1, live in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Live in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We saw in our previous message that uh, what Paul is saying there is that we've been called ultimately to a restored relationship with God. We've been called to eternal fellowship with the God who has made us. So he is saying, he's been saying, Live in fellowship with God down here on earth. Live in fellowship with God now in this age. Live like it. If God has restored you back to himself, you who have fallen and and, and sinned and you have uh, strayed from him, you who were once dead in your trespasses and sins, you once walked in those ways, you followed the course of the world, you walked in the ways of the devil himself, If that was once true of you, now as new creatures in Jesus Christ walk in a way that is worthy of that. Be what you are. Be what you are. Live like it. We saw the same thing again last Sunday. Later on in chapter 4, he says there, chapter 4, verse number 17, that we must no longer walk. So he says it negatively. We must no longer walk as the Gentiles. And we described what Gentiles 
uh, were. That's, those are, uh, first of all, non-Jews, but he's describing uh, unbelievers as Gentiles because this church in Ephesus was mostly made up of Gentiles. And so don't walk like you used to walk. Don't live like you used to. Why? So he's giving all these exhortations. Walk in a way, live in a way that's worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Don't walk like the world around you. Don't walk like your own sinfulness. Don't walk like the devil. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying this to us? What did we see last Sunday? What has God made us? Why are we so quiet this morning? I mean, do we get it all out, the singing? We can't talk now? By the way, there's, there's Denny. Why, why'd you, you guys move? I can't, I, I'm used to looking at you over there, but there you are. Okay? There you are. Why is he saying this? Why is he exhorting us so strongly to live in a way that is worthy of the heavenly calling that we have? To not live like the world. Why is he saying that? What has God made us? He's made us new creatures, right? New creations. We saw that last Sunday, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 21, 2, 3 there. And I mentioned uh, verse 22 and verse 24 when it says uh, to put off, to put on uh, the form and the tense of the verbs here. Uh, these, are, uh, these, are past, uh, these, are, these are passive, past tense verbs, meaning that this is, these are things that have already happened and that God has done. God has already put off of you, Adam, your old man, your old person, your sins. And God has put on to you the new man, Jesus Christ, in holiness and righteousness. Chapter 4, uh, four verse 24. You've been made new. The old has passed, the new has come. You've, you've had your old clothes that you inherited from Adam, those old, raggedy, dirty, torn clothes of sin and depravity. God has stripped you off of those things, those, those things off of you, and he's put onto you these new clothes, this new robe of Jesus Christ's very own righteousness and holiness. In other words, that's what we call justification. You've been justified. You have had your sins forgiven, and more than just your sins forgiven, you have had given to you, imputed to you, credited to you, and even put on to you the very robe of Jesus Christ's righteousness. Therefore, live like it is what he's saying. In Christ, you are righteous. In Christ, you are holy. Live like it. Be who you are. That's what he's saying here. And when we know who we are, when we know our identity, when we know that we are new creatures and new creations in Jesus Christ, as exemplified as we looked at last Sunday in our baptism, and when we know where our lives are going, so when we know who we are and where we're going, which is to live in eternal fellowship with God, then we will know what we are to be and how we are to live and what we are to do in the meantime. Right? We're new. We're on our way to see God face to face, to be with him forever. And until then, here's how we should live. That's chapter 4, 5, and also we'll see 6. So here in chapter 5, Paul's continuing this thought, and he's giving us another look at what our new creation life looks like. What does it mean to live a new creation life? What does it mean to not live like the world, but to live like the new world? What does it look like to not live like Adam, but to live like Jesus Christ? That's what he's describing. What is new life? What does it look like? So chapter 5, this morning, verses 1 through 14, another look at what new creation life looks like. And so let's hear what the Holy Spirit has uh, to say to us. First of all, notice there are just two points this morning. He says new creation life means, first of all, walk in love, not immorality. Walk in love, not immorality. He, now, he's just told us, look at chapter 4, verse 32. We left off last Sunday. We could have taken chapter 5, 1, and 2 with that last Sunday, but uh, here we are. Uh, 4, verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Period? Is there a period there? What, what else did he say? As God in Christ forgave you. So you are to be kind, you are to be tenderhearted, you are to forgive one another. Why? Because God, in Jesus Christ, has done that for you. He's forgiven you. Notice then chapter 5, verse 1 has this therefore, right? We always want to ask ourselves, when we see a therefore, what's it there for? And so 
therefore, right, this is the transition, because God in Christ has forgiven you, you are to be imitators of God as beloved children. God forgave you. You're a child of God now. You're a son of God. You are a daughter of God. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are an, a, a brother of Jesus Christ. He's your elder brother. You are a child of God. Therefore, be like your father and forgive. Therefore, be imitators of God. What's God like? God is a God who is kind. God is a God who is tenderhearted. God is a God who is forgiving. Amen? Be like God. Be like God. As we say, imitation, imitation is the best form of what? Flattery. Now, it's more than that, of course, with God, but imitation is the best form of flattery. As dads, we want our kids to pass on all the good stuff that we've tried to teach them and uh, that we've tried to model for them and to forget all the bad stuff. Imitation is the best form of flattery. How much more so? How much more so? In a more pure way, seek to be children of our Heavenly Father who's only taught us good, who's only exemplified and modeled for us what it is to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. How much more so should we be like our Heavenly Father? Notice verse 2 continues that very same thought by saying walk in love as, notice there's a lot of, there's a lot of similes here, as Christ loved us. And gave himself up for us, verse 2, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, invoking that Old Testament language of sacrifices. But they were offered up on an altar, and as they were burnt up, and the smoke ascended into the very nostrils of God, and it was a pleasing aroma to him. Walk in love, as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us. Again, Walk, meaning your lifestyle, what you are to be like uh, as a believer. And so what should the, the Christian lifestyle be like, according to verse number two? What's the Christian life supposed to look like, loved ones? Verse two. Love. Love. Walk in love, he says. Walk in love. What's love, though? Right? This is important for us. Walk in love. But, but what is love? How do you define love as super, super important? Do you know what love is? If I was to ask you to write a definition down, what, what, what would you say to me? If I were to take an offering right now of just your definitions and I collected them all, would you want me to read those for you? <laughs> all right, I'll abstain. I won't do that. But write down what you think love is. And I'll give you a little bit of a definition, a little bit of, a, of, a, of an explanation or description, but... It's important for us to know, as Paul says, walk in love, that we know what love is, or else how can we walk in it, right? Love is a deliberate commitment to give yourself to someone else for their good and benefit. That's what love is. It's a deliberate commitment to give yourself to someone else for their good and for their benefit. Do you realize that? Do you know that? Do you believe that? That's what love is. It's your deliberate commitment to give yourself to, to the person right next to you, the person that you care about, that you love, to benefit them for their good. That's so important for us because our culture doesn't know anything about this. It has no idea what real love is. We are taught every single day, kids, you're going to be taught every single day uh, that love is an emotion. It's a feeling. And so you're going to hear songs and you're, and you're going to hear Neighbors and friends and even your very own family members talk about falling in love and falling out of love. Now you might be able to fall into love, but you shouldn't be able to fall out of love if love is a commitment. If you deliberately commit yourself to someone else for their good and their benefit, you, that, that, that shouldn't end. That shouldn't end. We're taught in our, in our culture that love is what I can get out of a relationship. It's not my deliberate choice and commitment to someone else for their good and for their benefit. No, it's what I can get out of it. 
What's that called when I, when I have a relationship and it's only what I can get out of it? What, what do we call that? Selfish, isn't it? That's selfish. That's not love. That's lust. Notice how Paul defines love. Right? It, it's, it's a deliberate commitment to give yourself to someone else for their good and their benefit. And notice how he defines that or how he describes that. How do we know that that's true? Look at the rest of the verse. As Christ loved us, right? So we are to walk in love. We are to love others just as Christ loved us. But notice it's not a period there. He goes on and he explains or he describes and he gives an example of what it means that Christ has loved us. He gave himself up for us. He gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The selfless sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for selfish sinners like you and me, that's love. That's love. That the one who needs nothing, who from all of eternity, I go back to our first, uh, one of our first couple of messages in Ephesians in chapter 1, we talked about how God has, has loved his son, that he calls him the beloved. We talk about predestination and election. We first talk about that in terms of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Father has loved the Son, the Son has loved the Father, and, the, and together loved the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit has loved them reciprocally, eternally, perfectly, without any need of anything else. God is love. But yet, God, who is love, decided to. He committed himself. He determined to give himself for the benefit and good of others. He first of all made us, and even when we sinned, he still committed himself to loving us, to giving himself for us and our good and our benefit. How? By sending his son. The son that he loves eternally, who took upon himself human flesh, who humbled himself down to our level selflessly, and then he went even further and he sacrificed himself. Why? Was it because Jesus was a sinner? Was Jesus sacrificed because he sinned? No, he gave himself for us in our place to replace us, uh, to replace our sins with his love, uh, to take our place upon that cross. That is the beautiful love. That is the acceptable love that God has for us. For us. And so God says to you today who are here, who love yourselves, you who love yourself and you who won't even love God in return, God says to you that he loves you. And he shows you this by sending Jesus to the world, his very own son, to die for a sinner just like you. And so God speaks to us this morning, even as we're hearing here an exhortation to us as the body of Christ this is also for us to hear and also for us to say to any who do not know Jesus Christ that God loves sinners and he invites sinners like you to come to him, to receive true, everlasting, selfless love and that makes you part of God's everlasting family. Come to him this morning. You see around you a bunch of sinners this morning who've all accepted this love, who've all been loved by God, who've all left themselves behind to be loved by God. It doesn't take perfection. It doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take sinlessness. It doesn't take anything other than just coming with yourself and all your sins, and God says that he will love you in Jesus Christ. And so you and I are called as believers. We are called to live in love with each other here because we have been loved by God. But, notice verse 3. It's a big contrast here, verse 3. But... Sexual immorality, porneia is the, is the term. All impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. What, what is a saint? A child of God, right? But what does the imagery of a saint put into our minds? Right? Somebody who's, who's holy, right? Who's pure. You are saints. The church, the body, is, is a body of saints and holy ones. 
That's why he says these things aren't proper among you. They must not even be named among you. See the contrast there. See the contrast with with God who has loved us in Christ and who then calls us to love one another. The contrast of love, which is giving oneself to another for their good and for their benefit, the contrast is with selfishness. Notice that. What can I get out of it? My selfish lust. That's the contrast he's making. God is love. God is love. You, you are there for to love one another. In contrast to the selfishness, the self-centeredness that you once were. And he gives a little series here of three different terms. They, they cover all the kinds of sexual immorality that God condemns all throughout his word. I'll come to this in just a second, but to just state it as clearly as we possibly can, uh, we have to always remind ourselves of these things and teach our children these things, especially the times in which we live, uh, that sex is a gift of God that is to be enjoyed between one man and one woman, the commitment of marriage. That's what sex is for. That's why God gave it. Right? And the, the, the greatest example of that is in the beginning. God makes one man and one woman, and he joins them together, and they are to be fruitful and multiply. They are to enjoy the good gifts that God has given to them. That's the testimony of the entirety of the scriptures, beloved and friends. Everything else, every other use of sex outside of that commitment, that love, that covenant between one man and one woman, which we call marriage, Everything outside of that is sin. And that's not just to say, well, you know, homosexuality is sin. That is a heterosexual male who thinks about another woman, right? Every other use of sex outside of marriage is sin. And Paul's saying this to the church in Ephesus. Don't forget what we looked at in the book of Acts a while back. In Ephesus, their great, great goddess was Artemis. The Greeks called her Artemis. The Romans called her Diana. And if you've ever seen statues of her, uh, she looks like a prostitute. And you would worship Diana or Artemis uh, by going to sexual parties. And in honor of her, anything would go. It's not any different than today. The only difference is that you're not serving a goddess. You're serving yourself. Right? It's our, our, our culture is way more honest about it. Right? There's no pretense of going to a temple and having sex with a prostitute in the name of Diana or Artemis to somehow worship your God. No, you're just serving yourself. God bless you, at least you're honest. But that's the culture that he's writing to. That's the culture that we live in. Be who you are, though, is what he's saying. Be who you are. Walk in love, not immorality. And look at how Paul connects that with verse 4. We sometimes think of verse 3 as one thing and verse 4 as something else. It's really interesting how he connects all these things. He says, let there be no filthiness, obscenity, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. Again, they're not proper among saints. They're out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. So, notice, the context is immorality, sexual immorality in verse 3. And so what Paul is saying here is that we're not even to think or speak, let alone do immoral things, but to give thanks to God for his good gift of sex between one man and one woman in the commitment of marriage. In other words, don't even think about sex in ways that denigrate it as a gift of God. Don't speak of it in ways that cheapen it, let alone doing things that bring it down to the level of the world. Right, this is the verse that we always look at and say, you know, kids, you can't say cuss words. And we just rip it out of its context. Don't say bad words, kids. Right? Kids, don't say bad words this morning, not because of this verse, but don't say bad words. Okay? Use your words to honor and glorify God and to love your neighbor as yourself. This verse is dealing with sex, immorality, impurity, covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice how he reinforces that in verse 5 with a really serious warning. For you may be sure of this. That everyone who is sexually immoral, impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But I thought you just said God, that God loves me. I thought you just said that God 
loves sinners. But then, but then this very verse like takes a rug out from them, rips it out from underneath them. Is that what Paul's saying? What does he say on the one hand that God loves us? He gave himself up for us in Jesus Christ. But now he says, you know, if I slip up just once, I'm dead. I'm kaput eternally if I slip up once. Is Paul saying here to me, or maybe maybe your response is, well, does that mean that if I slip up one time and have dreams of sex with another person that I am somehow condemned? Is that what Paul's saying? Is Paul saying that, on the one hand, I'm forgiven of all my sins, but if I slip up and watch porn one time, am I condemned? What if I joke about sex? What if I even commit immorality? Is Paul saying that I've lost my salvation? If I'm baptized and then I go on to sin in this way, is is sexual sin so bad that if I sin in this way that I'm lost? Paul is saying that, uh, Paul's point is that if your life is characterized by immorality, impurity, covetousness, which is a form of idolatry, if your life is that, if that's your identity, if that's your walk, if that's your lifestyle then yes, you are under condemnation. He's he's talking about unbelievers here, right? Because it's not proper among saints to even talk of these things. But what if I do sin? What about me as a believer? Do, Do Christians sin? Do you sin, brothers and sisters? No way, no way. I don't believe it. Yes. So what happens then? Is, is, again, it was, so, okay, so Paul's writing about unbelievers, but then he's saying it's not proper amongst us. It's, it's not the right thing amongst us as believers to even talk or think, let alone do these things. So, so what if I'm a believer and I slip and I stumble and I fall back into, into a worldly way that I used to be, that I used to live in, that I used to love? Yes, Christians sin. Don't be surprised by that. Yes, we sin. I mean, we should see that we see it in ourselves, let alone all around us. Here's the difference, though. Paul is writing about those who, whose walk, whose lifestyle is characterized by these worldly things, and on the other hand, who's, what is characterized by falling after the Lord. The difference is that the believer does not want to go back into the world. It doesn't mean that you're not going to. It just means that you don't want to. Right? Your desires are different as a believer. The believer wants to love God and serve God and honor God and please God. And the believer wants to at least try to love neighbor as much as we naturally love ourselves. Right? The difference is the desire. Right? It's a heart matter. This is not just outward things. You know, if you say a bad word, you know, perish the thought. If you say a bad word, you know, you're, you're, you're eternally toast. No. The difference is the desire. And the difference is that when we as believers think, say, and do the things that we shouldn't, the things that are worldly, the things that are uh, in the old Adam, the old man, the things that we shouldn't even talk about, let alone think about, as he's describing here, the difference is that we are grieved by those slips and falls and thoughts and words and deeds. And that we're repentant for them. We are sorry for them because we know it displeases God. The difference is that I know that I am called to be an imitator of God. Why? Because God in Christ has forgiven me. And I know that he's forgiven me of all my sins, past, present, and future. That does not make me want to go sin more so that I can get more forgiveness. No, it makes me want to sin less. That's the believer's attitude. I don't want to continually have to say, God, I am sorry for this sin that I've done so many times. I can't even remember how many times. So he says to believers, he says to repentant believers, he says to sinful repentant believers who want to love God, who want to love neighbor, who want to not sin and who want to do the good, God says to you that God in Christ has forgiven you. God says to you this morning that Jesus Christ was sacrificed not just for all of your sins before you were converted, 
Not just all the sins before you were baptized. Not just all the sins that you repented of this morning in the shower before you came to church. God says to you in Jesus Christ that God has forgiven you of every single one of your sins. All the past sins, all your present sins, and all your future sins. Do you believe that? Now live like it. That's what Paul says. Now live like it. No, no, no. You don't want to listen to these prudish Christians, you see. You don't want to, you, don't want to, you know, these, these Christians today are just so overly influenced by purity culture. You know, all you guys do is harp about sex and how bad it is. You know, do you want us to go back to the Victorian age? Do we need chastity belts again? Is that what you're saying? You know, you don't want to follow these Christians. Come on. If you sin in your body, you know, that, that has nothing to do with your soul. I read an article recently on the attitudes of at least outwardly professing Christians, only God knows their hearts. The attitudes of professing Christians, men and women, to, to, uh, both, on whether or not it's okay to have an OnlyFans account. You don't even want to know what that is. Is it okay for a, for, a, for, a, for a Christian girl to have one, and is it okay for a Christian man to subscribe? You know, it's between consenting adults. It's in the sanctity of their own house, their own bedroom. And how many Christians, professing Christians today, say, you know, God still loves me. God still loves me. I can still have a relationship to him while I'm degrading myself with my body. You see, that's the ancient view of what's called Gnosticism, that what you do with your body has no bearing on your soul. What you do with your, your walk, your lifestyle, that doesn't do anything with your relationship to the divine, to the eternal. But that's, this ancient, that's an ancient false teaching that's going around today. When Paul says in verse 6, notice, let no one deceive you with empty words. He's talking about false teachers who are saying this very thing. Let no one deceive you with empty words. What are the empty words? It's exactly what he just said. Paul says as an apostle, there is no inheritance in God's kingdom for those whose life is this. And so he has to remind them, don't let these false teachers deceive you. They're saying that there is no consequence for your sins in the body because it doesn't affect your soul. No, no, no. For because of these things, verse 6, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now notice again that sons of disobedience, that takes us all the way back to chapter 2, where he again is describing our life before Christ. The spirit that, is at, that now is at work, chapter 2, verse 2. The spirit, Satan, who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That was once you. That's not you anymore. And those who are what you once were, are saying that you can do these kinds of sins and be good with God. No. Be who you are, brothers and sisters. As beloved children of God made new creations in Jesus Christ, love God in return. Show that by how you love your neighbor as yourself. We do that in the realm of our minds. We do that with our eyes. We do that with our words, with our bodies, by treating sex as the gift that it is from God, and not using it for our own selfishness. And if we are married, we use it in that way. If we are single, we glorify God with our bodies. We all are called to glorify God with our bodies, and our words, and our thoughts. Amen? Right? But it's not a different call for the married person as it is for the single person. No, we're all called to be holy. We're, we, are, we are saints. No, live like it. Now, secondly... Secondly, hopefully more briefly than that, uh, we, we are to walk in light, not in darkness. We are to walk in light, not in darkness. So he's, again, describing for us what this new creation life looks like. What does it mean to be a believer? What does it mean to uh, come, have come out of the world into the marvelous gospel? It means that you are to, to live as a new creature in Christ. 
in light, not in darkness. So live in love, not in morality. Live in light, not in darkness. It's the same thing, but different image, right? So therefore, do not become partakers with them. So he's concluding his argument, now he's going to push it forward. So therefore, do not become partners, partners with them. Now he's not saying that believers can't have unbelieving friends. That's not what he's saying here, right? No, he's, he, in the context, again, we are new creatures in Christ. We cannot live our lives in the old creation. We cannot live our lives as Adam. We cannot live our lives like we used to live our lives. We cannot live like our neighbors who are unbelievers live, right? You can't be partners with them in that sense. Paul says elsewhere, like, what fellowship does light have with darkness, right? So you can't live like these false teachers and those that they are teaching to continue to live like it doesn't matter. No, because he says, notice again, the the verse goes on to say, at one time, for at one time, Notice this contrast, meaning our old creation, our unbelieving state. At one time, you were darkness. It's really striking. It doesn't say that you were in darkness. You were darkness. But now, notice the contrast. But now, you are what? Light in the Lord. Not that you are in the light. You are light. You are light, right? This is a declaration of of truth. You are light. And that's why he's going to say, live in the light. But you are light, right? You are in Christ. You are forgiven. You are a child of God. You have had your sins taken off and you have put on Jesus Christ. You are light. Believe believe it or not, you you are light, brothers and sisters, right? We got to, I said last Sunday, you know, we got to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. I'm baptized. I belong to Jesus Christ. This is an amazing thing. You've got to be able to believe this, right? We, we have to say this to ourselves. I am light. I mean, my life does not look like it. Look around. I am not light, but God says I am, right? God says I am. The world says, are you kidding me? I say to myself, are you kidding me? And the devil says, get over yourself. God, though, says you are light in the Lord, right? Are, look at that, that, that word are, right? That's a statement of facts, right? This is the gospel. You are light, You once were darkness, but now you're light. Jesus is the light of the world, he said, amidst a world of darkness. And you belong to Jesus. You're in him, as Paul's been saying, in him so many times. He's the light, and you are light in him. That's your identity. That's your identity. And that's why he says, walk as children, verse number eight, walk as children of light. Be who you are. Be who who you are. What does it mean to live as light? Well, look at verse nine. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So earlier he talks about immorality, impurity, covetousness. Uh, He's talked about here uh, uh, in in another, another set of threes there, uh, where he says that uh, we are to have no filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. Now there's another set of threes. Good, right, true. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So wh- what does Paul mean by fruit here? What does he mean by fruit? What, like we use that as like, like, like a Christianese, right? As a Christianese. Like how do we translate Christianese into, a, into English? fruit, right? What does it mean? Works. Works, right? Deeds, like evidence, right? Demonstration, okay? So what are the deeds or the evidence of being a child of the light? Things that are good, things that are right, things that are true. Again, in contrast to immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking, right? Those are not fruits of light, those are fruits of darkness. And so, therefore, he says, it's imperative for you, verse 10, to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You are light. Live and walk in the light as children of light, evidencing the fruit of light, good, right, and true. And so you need to try to discern, verse 10, 
right? So you see, there's the, there's the identity and there's also the practicality of it. You, you are light, but you have to live like it. How? Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. This, this, uh, this, this verb, dokemazo, is, it's used a lot of times in the New Testament. It means to test something, to try something, to approve something even uh, at times. So what, what Paul is saying there is every time you think, every time you speak, or you do something, you've got to discern whether or not that pleases the Lord. Whether you're on your phone, right, or you're in front of our computer, or watching TV, listening to music, talking to friends at school, on your team, at work, at home, whatever it is. You and I need to test, try, and to prove whether that thing that we're doing, saying, thinking, pleases the Lord. Because we want it to be fruitful. We don't want to live evidence lives of darkness. No, we want to live new lives. Lives as children of the light. Why? Why should I want to please the Lord? It's like the most basic question of all, but why should I want to please the Lord? He loves us. He's forgiven us. He's given himself for us. I say he's fragrant offering and a pleasing, a pleasing aroma and fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Right, this is just another way of saying the first commandment. No other gods before me, which means only him. This is another way of saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What is pleasing to the Lord? You need to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And so Paul states it bluntly in verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them we are supposed to live in the fruits of the light not in the not with fruits of darkness right? this is a very stark contrast again be who you are be who you are for it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret be, be who you are as children of light don't go back into the darkness right don't sneak back in. Don't crawl back in. Don't get lured back in. Don't just dip one foot in, right? Just a little bit in the darkness, just to remember what it was like. Don't go back, he says. Be who you are. You've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of the Lord, and so be light. Now, it's interesting, verse 13 and 14, is like he applies this. What, like, notice what happens when you live in the light. Or when you live as light. When you who are light live as light amidst a dark world. What happens? But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. You flip on the switch, you press the button, you tell Siri or whatever it is to turn the lights on. Everything is now exposed. You can see everything. Right? When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. By your living as light, living differently than the darkness and in the darkness, not only are you going to stand out to those around you who are in darkness, but when you do that, you see, and again, Paul's writing to the ch a church in Ephesus. It's like one of the great, church, uh, great cities of the ancient world. Totally pagan. Totally pagan. When you live as light and different than the darkness, and you live as light in the midst of darkness, you are going to stick out. And everyone around you, their deeds are going to be exposed. That's what he's saying here. When you live as light in darkness, they, those who are in darkness are going to have light shown upon them and their deeds are going to be exposed. Because you're seeking to live a life of light in response to the gospel, people are going to be exposed to the law and the gospel. When you live a life that Paul, as Paul describes here, people are going to be confronted and their sins are going to be exposed. You don't need to go around with your finger wagging, thumping on your Bible to have this happen. This is going to happen. When you live a life that is different than the world, the world is going to notice. 
And their darkness is going to be exposed just by fact, by virtue of you being light, you see. They're going to be confronted with the holiness of God, the law. Their lives will be exposed as sin in God's sight, but they're also going to come in contact with the gospel. Does that make sense? Right? The whole world's full of darkness, and you're like little lamps that are just walking around, and everything that a lamp gets close to, it's going to be seen. On the one hand, that's bad news because their sins are being exposed, but on the other hand, there's good news because there is light, and there is gospel, there is good news. There, there's something else other than living in the darkness and stumbling around. Look at the end of verse 14. I've always thought that this verse had to do with believers, and that this was a call to believers, but... Uh, having thought about it some more and, and uh, just come, I, I've come to see this, this is a call to the unbeliever. Right? This is what Paul is saying. Light, live as light in the darkness. When that happens, darkness will be exposed, but also the light is going to go out into the eyes of dark people, blind people. And so therefore it says, and this is either some scripture passage from the prophet of, of Isaiah, uh, some scholars think it's a, an, an ancient Christian song, a, a poem, a hymn, uh, a creed, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Who's asleep? The unbeliever. Who's dead? Isn't that what Paul said in chapter 2? You who were dead. Right? Now we're alive. There are lots and lots of people who are dead. Doesn't take me to tell you that. Who are asleep although they're awake, right? They're dead, yet they're alive. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Again, if you don't know Jesus, you're asleep in your sin. You're living in darkness, the darkness of sin. Wake up, Jesus says. Arise. The light of the world will make light and make a way for you out of darkness. So be who you are, beloved. You are light. Live like it. You are loved. And so, love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. We bless and praise you for uh, Jesus, who is the light, who is the love of God incarnate. And so, lead us more to him, to want to please you, the Lord. And as we seek to live lives of love in a place, in a world of... uh, selfishness. Lord, may our love stand out, and as we seek to live as light and in a godly way, may our light shine. Expose the deeds of darkness. Lord, humble people. Cause in them a fear, Lord. A sorrow. A questioning. A wondering. A confusion, Lord, even. What is this light? What is this love? Bring them to Jesus, we pray. Use us to do that. Enable us, Lord, to be as forgiving, as kind and tenderhearted as our God is, who's given his Son all the way for us, committed himself in love for the good, for the good of the world. May we do the same. And we ask all this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen.